Hi folks, this is Richard Park joining you from London. Uh, it's fantastic to have the opportunity, even in these very difficult circumstances, uh, to contribute and to be a part of uh, this Effective Altruism global event. Uh, and it's awesome uh, that we're able to still get together, even if it's uh, over a screen rather than in person, uh, and keep our community uh, strong and engaged uh, and up to date on all of the great work that so many of us in the community are doing. Um, I work uh, as Managing Director of the Good Food Institute Europe. Uh, we're a nonprofit which works to uh, promote alternative proteins. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today um, about the prospects uh, and opportunities and challenges uh, that alternative proteins face around the world um, and trying to set out some of the work uh, that me and some of my colleagues are doing uh, to drive forward progress on alternative proteins in the interests of uh, health, uh, animal welfare and uh, the planet. And I'm going to be presenting today uh, to the title of Taking Good Food Global. I'm going to be talking about the international work uh, that uh, we're doing and colleagues are doing to drive forward uh, progress on alternative proteins all around the world. By way of a very quick introduction, uh, the Good Food Institute is a family of philanthropically funded nonprofits working to create a sustainable, healthy and just global food system. We were established in the US about four years ago now, but we're uh, looking globally uh, and expanding uh, to drive greater mission impact, greater outcomes, greater change uh, all across the world for our food system. Probably most people listening uh, may already know a bit about our theory of change, but I'll recap it quickly just in case. We uh, believe that uh, three main um, sets of uh, objectives uh, are at stake here. Uh, firstly is uh, public health uh, and the well-being of people. Secondly is the well-being of the billions of uh, animals raised for food around the world uh, that uh, exist at any one time. And thirdly is uh, the sustainability and the long-term health of our planet. So it's for those three uh, objectives uh, that we think alternative proteins are important. A brief outline of a challenge. Conventional ag animal agriculture is a significant contributor to some of the world's most pressing problems. Firstly, global food security. Growing crops to feed them to farm animals is inherently inefficient, driving up the price of grains and legumes and entrenching global poverty. Secondly, en environmental degradation. Conventional animal agriculture is a top contributor to climate change, water depletion and pollution, rainforest destruction and loss of biodiversity. Thirdly, and pressingly, antibiotic resistance. The vast majority of antibiotics used are administered to farm animals, and this is accelerating the evolution of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Fourthly, and importantly, uh, conventional animal agriculture subjects animals, billions of animals, to extreme confinement, trauma, and painful mutilations. So there's a whole host of reasons why we think a transition and reform of the global food system is important. Now, at this time, there's one question on all of our minds, uh, and that's how can we, as well as respond to the devastating uh, current pandemic, how can we prevent future pandemics emerging? Now, this is a big topic, and I'm not going to make it the focus of my talk, but just quickly to note that many disease outbreaks, as we know, are zoonotic originating in animals and then crossing the species barrier to humans. And many of these zoonotic diseases are linked to animals raised for food. Obvious examples are avian influenza from chickens and other birds and swine influenza from pigs. Now, in the long term, reforming the way we produce meat has the potential to make a contribution to a reduced risk of cross-species disease spread. This is a big topic, um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in considering it further to check out a very thoughtful and well-informed article uh, written recently uh, in Wired magazine by Lisbeck, PhD, who is GFI's Associate Director of Science and Technology. 
and the uh, hyperlink given on the slide will allow you to, to find that. Now, thinking back to all four of these challenges uh, outlined previously, uh, we think that an important part of the answer to those challenges uh, lies in alternative proteins. Brief definitions, plant-based meat, which is a combination of proteins, fats, minerals, and water, all the components of animal meat sourced directly from plants. And then there's cultivated or cell-based meat, which is meat produced from a small sample of animal cells replicated outside of the animal. Now, these two ways of producing meat have got the potential to deliver all of the pleasure and satisfaction and cultural significance that many people find in conventional meat, but deliver it in a much more sustainable and compassionate manner. We think promoting these things is a really important part of the road towards a more sustainable, just and kind food system. At the Good Food Institute, we work in three main ways to um, improve uh, and to drive forward progress uh, on these uh, um, technologies. Uh, we work with uh, directly with uh, scientists in order to drive forward the scientific breakthroughs which are needed to really bring the full potential of these um, interventions to scale. Uh, we work directly with companies to get more existing companies uh, stocking these products and selling these products, and also to drive the creation of new companies, new entrepreneurs, new investment in the sector. Thirdly, and very importantly, we work to promote a supportive policy environment for these things. We started about four years ago uh, in the US uh, and have built up an incredible um, set of expertise and an incredible track record of impact. But as an organization which is driven by outcomes and by an optimizing mindset, uh, a mindset which is uh, familiar to many in the EA community, we want to drive not just a US focused um, reform of the food system, but a, a global one. And to that end, um, GFI has established a series of affiliates uh, around the world in Brazil, India, Israel, Europe, and in Asia Pacific. And we work to strategically magnify and enlarge the impact that we have around the world. What I want to talk about in this talk today is quickly to run through some of those regions and to indicate and talk about some of the unique context uh, of promoting uh, alternative proteins uh, in those regions, uh, to identify some of the things which we think are priority areas for intervention, and to outline some plans for the future. Firstly, to start with Europe, uh, the part of the world that I know uh, the most. Um, why is Europe so important for uh, driving global change? Firstly, there's an absolutely massive set of human capital in Europe in terms of scientific expertise, uh, in terms of uh, entrepreneurial drive and vision, uh, and in terms also not just of human capital, but of financial capital. There's massive potential here. Um, it's got a market a population size twice that of the US, so it's a significant consumer of meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood. And also the stakes here are very high. There is a real, um, we are, we're at a real kind of fork in the, in the road, I think. Um, and there is a, a, a genuine chance that the uh, outlook for alternative proteins could either go really well or it could run into a series of roadblocks and risks. And so we think against the counterfactual that taking, uh, taking action and intervening in Europe uh, has got the potential for very high uh, impact. Um, to talk through some of the main challenges uh, which uh, alternative proteins face, uh, and from that, some of the work that um, I've been focused on to drive progress. We think that there are basically three key um, obstacles that need to be uh, overcome to see alternative proteins come to scale and the impact that we want. Firstly, it's scientific and actually ensuring that we can um, get scientific breakthroughs um, that are needed to um, create uh, better and cheaper products for people to enjoy. Um, secondly, uh, in Europe is regulation and ensuring that these products can fairly come to market. 
Um, and finally, uh, consumer acceptance and consumer attitudes. And to that end, public uh, engagement is really important. Um, some of the examples that GFI Europe has managed to uh, drive uh, change on over the last year uh, include um, we have a big focus has been to um, encourage the uh, European public funding um, sector uh, to engage and to invest in alternative proteins research and development. The EU is about to uh, sign off a, a 100 billion euro program uh, over the next seven years of research and innovation. Uh, we think there's a very strong case for uh, a chunk of that money to be invested in alternative proteins uh, R&D. Uh, and just within the within the last few months, we've actually had an important um, example of progress uh, on that front, which is through our engagement with uh, EIT, which is a, a major EU funding agency. Uh, we have um, uh, worked with them uh, and managed to encourage them successfully to make uh, alternative proteins one of their priority funding uh, areas uh, for calls for action for 2021. Um, this is just a first step. There's a long way to go, but it shows, I think, that this is a tractable uh, and a doable um, uh, endeavor. Um, Another important um, thing we've been working on uh, is fighting back uh, against some of the um, proposals which have come forward, echoing those which have been put forward in the US uh, and elsewhere in the world, which would seek to censor uh, and to ban terms such as veggie burger or vegan sausage roll, put forward by a, a small minority um, of uh, MEPs in the European Parliament. Uh, and we have been working with other like-minded organizations to push back uh, against this um, uh, irrational um, uh, proposed restriction on um, uh, what you can call uh, plant-based products. Uh, we have had some success in um, uh, prompting uh, relevant um, decision makers to uh, pause a little bit and reconsider um, some of these proposals. But we're right at the beginning of what will be a, a long uh, and a taxing um, uh, fight on this. Um, and although we've we've uh, made some initial progress, there's a lot more work to do. Uh, and that will uh, be a big focus uh, of our work in Europe going forward. Um, uh, another thing that we've been doing is trying to um, inform uh, and enlighten the public uh, debate and discourse uh, on alternative proteins, engaging with um, uh, mass media. Uh, we had a really um, encouraging success recently when uh, New Scientist magazine, which is the main uh, UK-based um, serious popular science magazine, um, devoted uh, their editorial page to uh, endorsing uh, the call for radically increased uh, investment, public investment uh, from governments in research and development for alternative proteins. So a good example um, of um, some of the success that we've been able to drive. Um, but all of these things, just we're right at the beginning of the journey. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, on all of these uh, factors um, and more. Uh, and it's something that we really relish the, uh, relish the, um, the fight for. Uh, and plan to get stuck into hard uh, over the coming years. Um, another critically important region, clearly, uh, for the success uh, of efforts to reform the global food system is the Asia Pacific uh, region, where Elaine Su leads a fantastic team of six um, people in uh, GFI uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, it goes without saying, uh, and is no surprise to members of the EA community, um, that the sheer scale uh, of the global population, the proportion of the global population uh, uh, in Asia Pacific makes it an absolutely critical um, arena uh, where the global uh, impact and prospects of alternative proteins will essentially be decided. Um, and so is just critically important to get right. Um, Elaine has been doing incredible work, um, including publishing the China plant-based meat industry report, which is the first ever um, uh, document and product uh, which um, sets out the state of the um, uh, China-based um, plant-based meat uh, sector. 
and provides a foundation for more investor, corporate and startup engagement. Uh, Elaine and her team have been helping to frame conversations around alternative proteins through public speaking, media exposure and in-person meetings. Uh, and her team have also supported the growth of plant-based and cultivated meat startups to create products suitable for the Asian market through strategic advice, connections, and publishing, creating resources such as the Hong Kong and Singapore editions of the Startup Manual, which are fantastic go-to guides for anyone that wants to know how to uh, create from scratch um, an exciting uh, and profitable and impactful um, uh, plant-based uh, or cultivated uh, meat uh, startup. Um, and so that's an example really of taking collateral, um, which has been um, started off in the US uh, and adapting it um, for the specific context um, of, uh, of uh, a different region. Um, going forward, um, Elaine has identified um, focusing on novel food ingredients focused on Asian cuisine. Clearly, you know, in the US, um, burgers has been where the, um, the, the product sector, uh, where uh, the plant-based um, progress has been quickest with Impossible Burger and beyond, etc. cetera. Um, that, you know, the proportion of burgers that are uh, eaten in uh, the Asia Pacific region is much lower um, and the shape of people's diets and cuisine is different. And so a big focus um, that uh, Elaine is working on in Asia is how to drive and accelerate innovation uh, in food ingredients and types which are um, uh, adapted to and focused on the Asian palate. Um, in terms of uh, context, of course, um, Asia Pacific can probably claim to be the uh, grand, the great grandmother and father of plant-based meat. Uh, there's actually the, a very rich um, sector that goes back millennia um, of what's called uh, mock meat, um, and all of that is, uh, you know, that comes with certain uh, it, that that is different from the direct uh, sensory mimicking uh, uh, products uh, which exist today, um, hopefully is a, is a cause for um, optimism about the prospects of alternative proteins uh, in Asia. Uh, other priorities uh, for Elaine and her team to work on are mapping technical barriers and white spaces, supporting the creation of solutions through R&D projects and industry collaboration, encouraging scientists and researchers to advance R&D and alternative proteins, dramatically increasing the number of research and the amount of government money invested in alternative protein at R&D. And you are seeing certain uh, Asia Pacific um, governments really taking an interest in going big on this, Singapore springing to mind, um, particularly where for the, you know, because of its um, focus on uh, food security and high tech and innovation, um, they've been pretty forward leaning on this. Um, and ditto actually on um, uh, ensuring that cultivated meat can come to market uh, in at least one Asian jurisdiction, if not more by 2020 and making that launch a success. Uh, these are some of the things which uh, Elaine uh, and her team will be prioritizing in years to come. Huge, huge, huge uh, potential for impact there. Um, turning to India and many, I suspect people uh, will know uh, Varun Deshpand, who uh, leads GFI India and who is also a stalwart of the uh, effective altruism uh, community and uh, in many ways uh, the, the driver and founder of the EA movement in India. Um, why is India important, uh, particularly important for the future of alternative proteins? Obviously, population, no need to say any more about that, um, a, a, an enormous and growing uh, proportion of the global population. Um, India also plays a crucial role and has a crucial potential to be a spearhead for alternative proteins throughout the developing world in terms of South-South cooperation between India and other developing countries and really providing a, a role model and a testing ground um, for, uh, for this sector. Um, also, Varun has identified um, that uh, the work that he's doing is particularly important perhaps in India uh, because the counterfactual is basically uh, I summarize, but the sector pretty much didn't exist and won't grow nearly as fast uh, if it wasn't for Varun and his team really uh, uh, making connections and driving this forward. Uh, so that's another reason why the work that he's doing is so particularly um, uh, important. Um, in terms of uh, work that Varun and team have done so far, 
Um, they recently hosted the very successful second version of the Future of Protein Summit, which was uh, an excellent conference which was over 400 speakers and attendees and really is the, the, the crucible uh, which is driving forward uh, the creation of the alternative protein sector uh, in India. Um, Varun has delivered incredible results uh, already, um, including working with uh, the government of India um, to secure uh, 640,000 uh, US dollars uh, of cultivated mutton research, um, which is a, uh, a type of meat which uh, is particularly uh, enjoyed uh, in uh, India, uh, and also working with the government in, of India um, uh, and uh, other players to um, drive forward the creation of a research centre for cultivated meat. Um, Aside from engagement with uh, policymakers, um, Barron's also been successful uh, in engaging senior leadership at over 25 major corporations in India, supporting the startup ecosystem, educating investors, and speaking at prominent industry events. Uh, in terms of looking forward, uh, GFI India is working on the launch of a mission for smart protein in partnership with government agencies, corporations, uh, universities, uh, and philanthropies. Um, again, it all comes back basically to driving the creation, catalyzing the creation of the alternative protein sector in India. Uh, and to that end, uh, GFI India is looking uh, to set up a, a startup incubator to take uh, nascent and newly formed um, alternative protein companies and really give them the, the kickstart, the expertise, the introductions that they need to succeed and to reach scale. Um, and uh, GFI India is also going to be advising companies on the development of corporate innovation facilities uh, and fostering the publication of pivotal market and consumer research. Um, we're also planning to establish a scientific research grant program to accelerate technology transfer for alternative proteins in India. Clearly, the science uh, base of India um, very strong. And if we can get um, more uh, Indian scientists working on creating the breakthroughs they need, that could really help drive the global acceleration uh, of scientific program, progress um, on alternative proteins. Uh, and GFI India will also be funding original research in economics, food systems, sustainability, and policy. Turning to Israel, from uh, one of the one of the world's uh, largest countries to one of the smallest. But still critically important, uh, Israel being a absolute tech powerhouse uh, and one of the most innovative and dynamic countries across the tech sector, uh, but particularly also in food technology. And actually the home uh, of uh, many of the most important startups, which are driving start well, more than startups, established companies, uh, e.g. Aleph Farms on the cultivated side, um, who are... Um, really uh, leading the way on this. Uh, Nir, uh, who uh, came on board just a few months ago, uh, has already um, helped to um, drive and, and work with the Israeli government uh, to plan for a national food institute, which will allow cutting edge food innovation. Uh, the team have worked with all of the big food companies in Israel in order to target their R&D resources toward alternative proteins. And uh, GFI and Nir and Co have held and participated in dozens of events, creating a name for GFI Israel as Israel's thought leader in this field. We're very lucky uh, to have um, Tom on board, a senior scientist who is uh, a genius level um, thinker and uh, driver of science, uh, science research and is one of the, the most uh, respected um, players in this field and is really driving, driving things forward strongly in, uh, in Israel. Um, looking forward, the team wants to compile a national plan uh, for making Israel a top global alternative proteins R&D center. Um, they're aiming to stimulate academic research through intense engagement with leading institutions, giving courses and lectures, organizing events, and building student groups. Uh, commensurate with the scientific expertise and focus of the team, uh, they're looking to create a fund for PhD students, uh, specifically targeting alternative protein research and therefore generating significant additional uh, research in the field. Um, and they think the, the GFI uh, uh, Israel team is um, going to be, um, uh, yes, helping to drive significantly more uh, scientific breakthroughs coming out of Israel. 
Uh, and the team is also looking uh, to engage uh, at a policy level with the Israeli government with the uh, objective uh, of encouraging the Israeli government to become a, uh, to commit to become a global leader in alternative proteins, R and D. So together with uh, Or, Hadass and Lior, um, Nir and Tom uh, are uh, really making uh, incredible uh, progress uh, in Israel. Um, last but very much not least, um, and zipping all over the globe, turning now to Latin America uh, and uh, Brazil uh, as one of the crucial um, crucial uh, arenas uh, for uh, alternative proteins uh, work. Uh, clearly, Brazil, the economic powerhouse uh, of Latin America, um, and also, as we know, uh, a, uh, a, um, a, a place uh, where meat is enjoyed and where meat is um, uh, produced uh, at scale. Uh, Brazil, uh, GFI, uh, uh, led uh, by uh, the fantastic Gus uh, in, uh, in Brazil, um, who has basically, without wanting to exaggerate too much, um, over the last um, two or three years, basically um, uh, helped to move the Brazilian alternative protein sector from essentially non-existence uh, towards um, an absolute ton of product launches uh, and a ton of new entrants, um, not just to the local Brazilian uh, plant-based meat market, but actually also increasingly encouraging them to export and to go global. Um, there's a ton of specific examples, um, a good one being the Futuro burger, uh, which was the first real next generation plant-based burger sold in Brazil. Uh, and Gus and his team were um, in at the ground level of uh, uh, interacting uh, with the uh, with the company that launched that to provide them advice and guidance and to encourage them uh, to move into the plant based sector um, and is a is a huge huge success and now and now going global. Um, Gus and his team have engaged with uh, many leading um, uh, companies, including some of the largest uh, animal product corporations in the world, playing a key role in successful national and global launches of their plant based products. Um, also, with the advice of uh, Alexandra Cabral, um, has uh, worked to successfully uh, engage with the Brazilian government um, uh, on uh, important things such as a regulatory process for both plant-based and cultivated meat. Uh, and Gus has uh, built a strong partnership with Brazil's National Public Agriculture Research Institute, Embrapa, to stimulate scientific research on alternative proteins. Looking forward, uh, Gus is planning to uh, expand uh, that work um, with a particular focus on the regulatory agenda uh, with the goal of making Brazil one of the first five countries to uh, fully regulate cultivated meat. Um, the team in Brazil is looking to stimulate local research through partnership with Embrapa and helping researchers secure government grant funds. Plans to continue to work with the uh, Brazilian industry, investors and startups to launch excellent products widely available at a competitive price. Um, uh, Gus and team will be coordinating corporate funded research consortia with the potential to significantly alter product cost availability and taste texture of these products. Uh, and importantly, um, accelerating global competition in the industry by increasing the number of Brazilian companies selling at a competitive price point on the global market. So that, that concludes our world tour of alternative proteins from covering pretty much every region of the world, covering countries large and small, covering histories, geographies, languages, cultures, which differ widely, uh, and each of which present unique both challenges, uh, but also opportunities for the alternative protein sector. Uh, and um, at GFI, uh, we're very, very excited about driving forward this work. Uh, we One of our great values is working in partnership uh, with other like-minded organizations uh, and individuals. So if anyone listening to this, uh, if any of your ears have pricked up at all, if any of uh, any of this has uh, been of interest, if you spot particular opportunities, if you want to help, if you want to support us in any way to uh, accelerate this work, if you can offer introductions, if you're a, you want to start up a company yourself, uh, if you want to um, offer talent, time, resources, money, volunteering. Uh, if you just want to find out more and enter into our 
um, enter into our orbit to be kept up to date uh, on the latest news from GFI US and the GFI Global Affiliates, please do reach out to me uh, on richardp at gfi.org. Um, and we'd be really excited to uh, work with you going forward uh, and to continue to drive positive reforms of the global food system uh, with the objective of uh, helping people, helping the planet uh, and helping animals. So uh, thank you very much and uh, look forward to um, staying in touch uh, with, uh, with uh, people who've been listening to this. Thank you. Okay, folks, thank you very much for bearing with me and listening uh, on that presentation. I hope it was uh, a fun whistle-stop tour uh, of the literally the world of alternative proteins. Um, at GFI, uh, as I said, we are keen to engage and to work uh, with uh, anyone and everyone who is, uh, shares our values and shares our objectives um, of accelerating progress uh, on alternative proteins. So please, uh, if anything that I've said, uh, or if anything that Zach and Amy on the previous GFI presentation have said uh, has um, tickled your interest or caught your imagination, uh, please do uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're always looking for assistance, support, um, donations, solidarity, um, uh, working together, ideas, introductions, uh, introductions to networks, um, et cetera. Uh, this is a very, very big challenge, and it's going to take much more than just um, uh, uh, us as individuals or us even as one organization working on it. Uh, it, needs a, it needs a network and it needs a team uh, of people to get to the place that we want to be. So please do uh, reach out uh, to me uh, if you are interested in uh, engaging and finding out more. Uh, and I hope that um, uh, people enjoy the rest of this virtual conference. Uh, and I hope uh, at this time of challenge um, that uh, we can um, at least um, make uh, a crack on with, with making some positive changes um, on uh, all the agendas that we care about. So thank you very much.